Hi, and welcome to Lesson 3 of our Matter and Energy Unit. Lesson 3 is going to deal with conservation of energy. And so I thought I'd put up this picture of a hamburger just to kind of remind us how this process is going to work. When we eat a hamburger or any food, the energy that's in that hamburger is going to be transferred to our body. At least part of it is. We're going to then use that energy to do things like be a good student, or get to class on time, or make a bunch of videos for a bunch of chemistry students. That's one example of the conservation of energy. And so that's why it's here. The law of conservation of energy is also known as the first law of thermodynamics. And it's simply that energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transformed. The substance that you see on this slide is trinitrotoluene, also known as TNT. It has a lot of energy stored in it. That energy can be transformed into the typical kind of explosion that you see when somebody detonates a stick of dynamite. But it's important to understand that that energy that we see in the explosion was previously stored in the molecules in the substance. The dynamite did not create any energy and the dynamite did not destroy any energy. That's really, really important. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed. That's this notion of conservation of energy. And that way it's very similar to that law of conservation of mass that we talked about a few lessons ago. When we look at the changes in energy over the course of a process, we really see one of two things. A change can be known as exothermic. In that case, the substance is going to release energy. That's gonna cause the temperature of our surroundings to increase. Exo, by the way, just means out. So an exothermic process just means out heat, the releasing of heat energy. Or the process can be endothermic. In an endothermic process, over the course of that change, the substance is going to absorb energy from its surroundings. Endo just means in, so endothermic literally translates into in heat. An endothermic process is going to wind up decreasing the heat content of our surroundings. A lot of times we're really going to be interested in the amount of energy that was stored in the substance before and after the change that we're investigating. For that, we're going to use this concept of enthalpy. Enthalpy is just defined as a measurement of the potential energy stored in a substance. We symbolize it as H because E was already taken. What we're really most interested in over the course of a particular process is the change in the enthalpy of the substance or the delta H. This isn't a bad time to take a moment and talk about the fact that here in chemistry, because we're always so interested in changes, we've made a shorthand for change by using the Greek symbol for delta. So delta H just means change in enthalpy. We'll see this delta notation a lot over this course, but this is a good first introduction to it. The way we're always going to find out how something has changed is by looking at what it is at the end or after the process and subtracting what it was at the beginning from it. So in the case of delta H or the change in enthalpy, we're going to take the enthalpy that we have at the end or enthalpy final and subtract the enthalpy that we had at the beginning or enthalpy initial from it. Exothermic processes are going to wind up having a negative value for their delta H. This is because over the course of that process, heat was released. And so the enthalpy of our products is going to be less than the enthalpy of our reactants. So when we do this math, we're going to wind up subtracting a larger number from a smaller number, which is always going to give us a negative value. Endothermic processes are going to have a positive delta H value because we've put energy into the substance. So we'll wind up subtracting a smaller number from a larger number, which will always be a positive value. Reference table I gives us a whole bunch of chemical and physical processes that we'll investigate during this class. Each one has a different delta H value. And notice that those delta H values are both positive and negative. If you forget that negative delta H's are exothermic and positive is endothermic, you can always go to the bottom of reference table I where it reminds you that a minus sign indicates an exothermic reaction. Let's take a look at an example problem from page seven in our unit packet and see if we can use this law of conservation of energy to analyze what's going on. For the reaction A plus B yields C, the reactants A and B have 80 kilojoules of energy total stored in their bonds, and the product contains 20 kilojoules of energy stored in its bonds. The first question is, what was the change in energy or delta H for the reaction? And the second question is, what would happen to the temperature of the water in the calorimeter where this reaction occurred? So this is a two part problem. Take a moment and try to solve this on your own. And then when you're ready, hit play and let's go through it and see if we can solve it together. Let's do part one first. What was the change in energy or the delta H for this reaction? In order to do that, let's take a look at the reaction. A plus B are yielding C. 
We know that A and B have 80 kilojoules of energy stored in their bonds, and we know that C has 20 kilojoules of energy stored in its bonds. In order to figure out delta H, we're just going to take the enthalpy of our products and subtract the enthalpy of our reactants from that. That's going to wind up being 20 kilojoules minus 80 kilojoules. And so when we do that, we wind up with a total of negative 60 kilojoules for our answer. Now, if you remember back to what we just talked about, a negative delta H means that we're talking about an exothermic process. Let's move on and look at part two. In question two, what would happen to the temperature of the water in a calorimeter where this reaction occurred? Delta H is negative 60 kilojoules, which tells us that it's an exothermic process. Because it's an exothermic process, we know that we're going to release energy into our surroundings. The water of our calorimeter is part of our surroundings, and so they will absorb the energy that's released, and we would expect that the temperature of the water would increase as a result. Do these make sense? If they don't, take a moment and jot down any questions that you have. And then when you're ready, let's move on. We would mentioned in our previous conversation that we're really only going to use joules in this class, but another common unit of energy is the calorie, which of course we're all familiar with from dietary labels. Calories are a unit that we generally will not be using here, but I thought that we should talk about them a little bit since we see them so much in our lives. One calorie of heat is defined as the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius or one degree Kelvin. Remember, they're the same thing. One calorie is defined as 4.18 joules per gram degrees Kelvin or degrees Celsius. So it would take 4.18 joules of energy to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius or Kelvin. Dietary calories are actually kilocalories. We write them with a capital C to show that they're different than the regular lowercase c calorie. That's actually a thousand calories. That's defined as the heat needed to raise one liter or 1,000 grams of water by one degree Celsius. When we look at nutrition labels, the values that are given to us there are actually those dietary kilocalories. In this particular case, there are 250 calories in a serving of this substance. So if we ate that substance, that would give us enough energy needed to raise the temperature of 250 liters of water by one degree Celsius or one liter of water by 250 degrees Celsius if, if we ignored the whole boiling point thing. However you wanna look at it, it's obviously a lot of energy that we require in order to remain alive and functional organism. Here at the end of the video, let's make sure that you can do each of the following. Make sure that you can explain the law of conservation of energy. Make sure that you can apply it in order to solve problems and determine whether or not things are exothermic or endothermic. And finally, make sure if you're given a value for delta H that you can determine whether or not a particular process is endothermic or exothermic. If you can do all of those, fantastic. If not, take a moment, write down any questions that you have. You can always leave a comment for me in the comment field below the video, or you can always get in contact with me through the contact information in the info field. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Take it easy.